Hello, everyone. Welcome to the MIPOS Plus seminar. Today, uh, Daniel Widdeson from uh, our group in the Materials Innovation Factory at the University of Liverpool will practice his talk for the British Crystallographic Association meeting starting tomorrow. And Dan will talk about fast detection of near-duplicate structures across major crystal databases. Over to you, Dan, please. Thank you. Uh... Yeah, okay, so I suppose this is about new work, um, building on the invariants we've been developing for several years, um, and we've managed to take it in a slightly new direction to do something interesting, so that's what this is about. The first half, I suppose, will be more about introducing the invariant, which will be important for the meeting, but maybe some of you have seen a lot of that, and then we'll talk about results, uh, the matches between the databases, which will be fun, hopefully. So, um. To summarize everything to start off with, um, what we do is investigate what we call isometry invariants, which uh, I think you can think of as descriptors of uh, crystal structures with certain mathematical properties that we like. Um, I'm going to give this talk, by the way, as assuming that there's not too, too much mathematical knowledge in the audience because it's a crystallographic meeting, but there might be a little bit. So. Um, Basically, these descriptors are built to have properties that um, are desirable and um, you don't have to leave it up to chance when you are trying to compare two crystals and uh, finding a distance between them. The distance that we produce has, uh, has I guess, properties that uh, we uh, like and they're proven to, to work. So we'll, we'll explore how that works. So once we get these descriptors or invariants, as we call them, we can stick them into a big matrix and then make a binary search tree out of them, which I'll briefly go over. Um, and then using that search tree, you can make binding close matches really, really quick. So um, I'm going to start by trying to introduce the invariant itself. So I've written here what the IC IUCR defines as a crystal, which is purposefully not precise, not mathematical, uh, and is English and kind of vague. Uh, and that's probably because crystals are a complicated class of, of things. But we try and approach this problem with mathematics. So we want something a bit more well-defined. And we start with this idea of a periodic point set, which is um, basically a unit cell and a motif combined to give an infinite um, set of points without any radii. So we throw away our um, atomic types and we just get an infinite set of points which repeat on and on like a crystal does. Um, and our point is that many of these periodic point sets are actually the same thing. So we could take a periodic set and apply a translational rotation to it and we get an equivalent thing, but all the coordinates have changed and we want to do this properly from the ground up so that those equivalent structures are naturally seen as identical to each other. So here's a, a formal definition of a periodic set, if you like. Uh, I don't think it's too important to pay attention to this bit of maths. Um, you could probably just think of this as the intuition you have in your head when you think of a crystal. Um, it's an infinite periodic set of points that goes in all directions. This is 2D here, but it can be any dimension. We're usually going to think of three. Um, but this is an ambiguous uh, representation because I can choose many different uh, choices for my unit cell and or motif that give rise to the same periodic set of points. And that ambiguity is something we want to snub out from the very start rather than having to deal with it later on. So we actually define our descriptor in a way that uh, is independent of this unit cell motif choice. And... Um, Mathematically, what we'd say is uh, if, two if two periodic sets or crystals can be mapped onto each other by a rigid motion, which is translation plus rotation, then they should be considered the, uh, the same thing, identical. Um, and the maths behind this uses things like uh, called equivalence classes, isometries and equivalence relation, and you have this space of periodic sets, but I don't think any of this is too important um, but I will try and list 
the um, the properties which we'd like from this descriptor um, because I think they'll become relevant when we talk about them later. So here's one particular property which we care about quite a lot, for example. Um, we want this descriptor to be continuous. So what do I mean by that? So the two crystals below, if I just gave you the very general question, like what should a distance between them be? Should it be small? Should it be large? Well, our argument is that if you take away the green lines, which are the boundaries of the unit cell, which aren't fundamental to the set, right? They're just sort of guidelines. If you take away those green lines, they look very similar and you can map one onto the other with a small perturbation of points, right? So the distance between these should be very small. But if you were to measure them with something like the unit cell volume, you get a big difference. In fact, twice different, right? And it's something we want to avoid. Um, this is one of the points that we require from what we call like a sensible invariant or descriptor. So I'm going to list them all now. And I think this is the end of anything that's mathematically difficult to pass at all. What we want at the end of the day is something, a function that takes in a crystal and outputs a more mathematical object. I'm thinking of a matrix or a vector. And what we want from it are these five things. So isometry invariance means if two crystals that we put in are equivalent, so you can put one onto the other via rigid motion, then they're guaranteed to have the same output in our function. So we can identify periodic sets that are the same, basically. And anything that doesn't follow this kind of just doesn't make much sense. I mean, it, it doesn't make really any sense for two identical crystals to be given different descriptors. Maybe for some people, they don't mind that. They deal with it on their own terms. But you may as well build up your descriptor from the ground up to actually describe your crystal in full. Then number two is kind of the converse to that. I think I'm going to um, skirt, skirt around talking about completeness too much, but that guarantees that if you have two different crystals, they go to different outputs of the function. So that isn't true for something like density. Density is an isometric invariant because if you have two identical crystals, they give the same density every time. But it's very easy to construct two very different crystals with the same or very similar density. And we'll see that later, actually. Um, we want our descriptor to be as complete as possible, meaning it distinguishes as many crystals that are different as possible. And continuity, we just mentioned. So if I smoothly move around points in this periodic set, it results in a smooth change in the output of this descriptor, this uh, invariant. Uh, I'll skip over metric a little bit because it doesn't really get mentioned so much, but we want there to be a proper mathematical metric that satis satisfies certain conditions, um, which I think is more difficult for some descriptors than others, but ours is just going to be a vector, the one we talk about really. So, so we just compare that with uh, this very standard metrics you put on any vector. And then we don't want it to take too long to compute. Um, I suppose if, if the first four were fully satisfied, then that would be of uh, a theoretical interest anyway, regardless of the computability. But if you actually want to put this into use in like a curation process, you can't be waiting around for many days um, to compute descriptors for a few thousand crystals, really, if you can help it. <clears throat> so at the bottom there, I've written something, some stuff about other descriptors which fail these things in various ways doesn't mean they're bad it just means they fail this so you can't rely on them to give you certain nice properties reduced cells can change like very violently even if a, a unit cell parameter is just slightly out right when you reduce a cell it could reduce something else uh, density is very incomplete and P P pxrd comparisons are, aren't actually metrics so that kind of uh, don't have a lot of the properties we like. Uh, so I've listed all this, and I think that's the end of everything that could be considered annoying maths. And we can just introduce the invariant, which is quite easy to construct. So this is our input crystal. 
uh, ethane 01, that's a real crystal from the CSD. And we're going to construct from it something called the pointwise distance distribution, which just is going to put together a bunch of interpoint distances in this crystal in a certain way. Um, and it makes sure that the list of properties get satisfied as much as we can. So we start by just looking through all the atoms in the unit cell and listing distances to their nearest neighbors in order. So this, this top one, for example, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor actually, maybe not, but um, uh, the top list of, yeah. hmm, you can? You can, yes. Oh, okay, fine. good. Um, this top list of values is for the carbon atom in this molecule. So the first three are the same, they're just to the surrounding hydrogens. And then the next one is to the other carbon atom, right? So you can list as many distances as you want. This goes beyond the boundary of the unit cell. Theoretically list infinitely many, but you have to choose some number to stop at, which we call K. So in this example, I'll, I mean, I've listed four here, but like the example I'm about to show, we go up to 10. So uh, K equals 100 is a very typical number. And so K being this number of neighbors, think of it as like the radius you're willing to go out to, to observe the environment of these atoms. Okay, we've got a bunch of lists of distances from atoms to other atoms. Then we collect them into this matrix. So each row is one of these lists. And if we have two lists, which are the same, every element of two lists is the same, then we merge them into one list and we give these weights, which are proportional to the number of times the list appeared. So uh, for crystallographers, the weight will kind of depend on, well, so it's two symmetrically equivalent atoms, like I mentioned here, if any lists are identical, brackets symmetry. So if you have two sites which are symmetrically identical, they have the same environment. So they'll have the same distances to their nearest neighbors and therefore you get the same lift and they'll collapse down. So this weight here has a lot to do with the Wyckoff multiplicity of the atom in question. Here we've got four uh, asymmetric sites. So we get four uh, and they all have the same Wyckoff multiplicity. So we end up with four rows, each with weight one quarter. Uh, and then we order this matrix just so it's uh, it's stable and you get the same output for uh, any choice of arrangement input atoms. And then we've got this matrix, which is our descriptor. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about this particular matrix because I'm going to immediately um, talk about a different descriptor you get when you take the average. So we take this matrix, take a weighted average, and we end up with a vector called the AMD. The matrix is called pointwise distance distribution. This is called average minimum distance. So when we take this average, we lose some information. The matrix here is quite descriptively rich. We can actually prove that uh, in a way. Uh, and taking the average does lose some information, but you get uh, a lot of benefit in that it's a vector and easier to compare and faster and cheaper to store. It's just smaller. And um, even though they do lose information, they don't to the same extent as something like density. Um, all the counter examples have had to be constructed where AMD gets confused between two different things, which can happen, but they've had to be, those instances have had to be constructed so far. It doesn't really happen for real crystals, at least as, as we know. So this AMD, if, even if uh, the construction there didn't make sense, you should think this AMD is the output of uh, our function, it's the invariant we were looking for. You can give a crystal to this AMD and it gives you a vector, which is a descriptor. This is the descriptor we're talking about. So let's talk a little bit about the properties. Um, I'm about 14 minutes in, hopefully I can get through. So these things are obviously invariants. We constructed them to be that way. And if you think about it, it's kind of obvious because um, we just collected together interpoint distances. If you apply a translation or a rotation, then that those lists aren't going to change because none of the interpoint distances change. And they're continuous for basically the same reason. Computability is very good. So if you're a computer scientist, you'd care that uh, it's computable in near linear time in the main sort of uh, input 
in, in the motive size of K, which are the two parameters that affect how long it's take for the most part. Practically speaking, on my desktop, which is pretty average with one core, so you can accelerate this if you want, three milliseconds is a very typical sort of time for K equals 100. So anyone should be able to process several thousand crystals without really any trouble whatsoever. Then the last point there is on completeness, um, which I'll, I'll kind of briefly skip over, but PDDs are quite descriptively rich um, and you can actually reconstruct most periodic sets from their PDD, meaning it's almost perfectly describing the complete uh, arrangement of atoms in space. AMDs aren't uh, like that because the average loses information, but they're like practically complete. We have, uh, we've looked far and wide for crystals which AMD can't distinguish and we can't really find them, so it's good. Before I move on to the actual result, I think it's important to just briefly touch on what a KD tree is. So if you're familiar with principle of binary search, um, this you'll be a lot more comfortable with this idea, but basically it takes um, many, many, if you want to search for something in a set, say, you could do a brute force search where you just compare your item you want to find against everything until you find it. Um, but a binary search is much, much faster. Imagine you have a sorted list. You'd start in the center of the list, right? And uh, if it's too big, then you know that your item lives on the left. And if it's too small, your item lives on the right. So you, each comparison deletes like half of the potential things you could match against. So you go from polynomial time to logarithmic time, just to give an impression. Uh, brute force, if you had a million items you were looking through, brute force would require a million comparisons. But a binary search would require something more like 20 comparisons. So huge reduction in the number of comparisons you have to do, which is why I'm introducing this. It's an important part of why we were able to do it so quickly. And it's also important that our invariants are vectors and not other complicated descriptors like a, a graph or something like that, because KD trees um, work on n-dimensional space and it needs the inputs to be vectors. So what we did was calculate the AMDs for all CSD crystals and all COD crystals. We made a KD tree from the CSD and then we searched for each COD crystal in it and this is what we found. So about 1.2 million CSD entries and half a million COD entries. And we found an overlap of over 400,000 uh, matches. So most of the COD actually exists somewhere in the CSD. Um, the CSD is a lot bigger, so um, you couldn't have the majority of CSD and COD, but there's a lot of entries which cross over between them. This makes a lot of sense because crystallographers um, submit their bindings in their papers and their crystals to both databases. Um, so we, after that, we checked that they all had the same composition, composition, which they did. There's 26 anomalies, which I'll get onto in the next slide. But the time for this CSD COD comparison was 17 minutes. So that doesn't include AMD time, which is around 20 minutes, maybe a bit more. I think that's for CSD only. So maybe you're looking at 30 minutes for CSD plus COD, then 17 minutes to find these matches. So not long at all. And then for the ICSD, um, we, we looked because why not? Uh, the COD, Chris, I actually realize I haven't introduced what the COD is in case people don't know. It's Open Crystallograph Crystallography Database, Crystallography Open Database, which is open. The CSD is closed, um, but people submit their papers to both. And uh, so you expect overlap. COD contains inorganic structures and organic. CSD is supposed to be organic and ICSD is supposed to be inorganic, but there is overlaps. So we actually found several thousand in the CSD and ICSD. If you look through a lot of these, they are known to be duplicates of each other. That's intended. And a bunch of ICSD crystals were in COD as well. And we also found a bunch of duplicates within each database themselves. I think most of those are intended as well. This um, this Venn diagram is supposed to be an accurate representation of the overlap. So you can see this little slither is where they all overlap and the overlap between CSD and COD is very big. So what about the anomalies? 
very quick. So we've got 26 matches which didn't end up with the same composition. 20 of those, I looked in the SIFs and there was just a typo. So this uh, on the top right here, number one, is a very typical example of what that typo looks like. Um, the label says O1, indicating it's an oxygen atom, but the symbol column um, indicates carbon. So what happened is the COD read this carbon and assumed it was a carbon atom. The CSD read this label O1 and assumed it was an oxygen atom and the entries now disagree. So one of them should be corrected. Uh, some of these have been mentioned in the entry notes of the CSD entry, um, but some haven't. Four of these matches we've already reported to the CSD, and uh, these are instances where an author seems to have copied um, coordinates over and replaced an atom, and so we've kind of uh, have explained these away. And there's two more, which I can't really explain. One I have a half decent explanation for, and the other one I don't. So this uh, pin hop and uh, this um, COD code or ID. So if we look at the bottom here, the top row is what was actually published. Now, I just realized I have overrun a bit, but I will make sure to uh, to keep the slides shorter for tomorrow, but we can, I have a, some time today, so that's okay. Um, so what we have at the top is what was published. Now this structure was published in 1994. The SIF was invented in 1991. So I don't know if it was widely used at that point, but if you look at the publication, there is no SIF. This was in the time when you would actually just print the table of coordinates in your paper rather than um, adding it as a file in the supplementary materials. And you see it's got uh, C10, C11 in the published version. But if you download the SIF from the CSD, it says CL1 in the label instead of C11. Now, given that this table in the published uh, paper had to be probably manually read and interpreted, I think everyone should probably have the same idea as me that this was just a mistake in copying the data from table to another. Now, the other pair, um, I don't know why an error happened, but an error happened somewhere. The uh, CSD entry cell how has an iodine where the other one has an, a gold. I believe the gold is correct, looking at the original SIF. I don't know where the iodine atom came from, so we'll have to just ask the CSD about that. So all the anomalies are explained, I guess, except one. Um, and now quickly, hopefully, <laughs> I have some time, I guess. What about other approaches? Could we do this with something else? Here's an example where density gives you a problem that doesn't exist with uh, AMD. So these are completely different crystals. They're poor renderings, but you can see they're very different. The unit cells, nothing alike. The molecules, nothing alike. Not related at all. But their density agree up to the fourth decimal place. And actually, uh, the atomic mass of atoms is typically given to like four decimal places. Um, so these densities pretty much agree all the way to the end. Uh, and this is something that didn't happen with AMD. AMD is able to distinguish these because they're geometrically very different. It just so happens that density coincides because density is only a single value, only takes on uh, a range, quite a small range. If you put a million crystals in that range, some of them overlap. It's just is what it is. Um, and if you use density to do what we did here, you get a lot of these false positives. What about some others, like cell parameters? Also prone to the false positives. You can have two different crystals with the same cell parameters, especially in cubics, say. Um, but also, they're just invariant, non-invariant, non-continuous. Actually, I guess reduced cell parameters are technically invariant, um, but you are possibly going to miss identical crystals because you can't rely on the cell parameters to always give you the same answer. Uh, what about matching, say, publication? It's just not, not a good idea either. Maybe one publication, there's many crystals, and um, sometimes the curation process changes the DOI and, and things like this. It's, it's just a bit messy. You'd find a lot of matches that way, but it just wouldn't be very reliable. 
And the general problem is that most data, including these SIFs, is subject to change. Nothing is sacred. If the curators want to change something in a SIF, they will. Um, so they don't always write that down in the uh, in the remarks of the entry. And uh, if you can't put any any of your idea, if you can't put your comparator into like a binary search type thing, it's going to take a long time because you'll have billions of comparisons, something like uh, RMSD would just never be able to do it. It's just too many, right? Um, I guess I'll skip over the slide because I've overrun by quite a lot by this point, but it's a rough uh, layout of how you'd use this idea and sort of the curation process to check that there's no geometric duplicates already in your database when you add a new SIF. Uh, if you want to try AMD or PDD, the uh, package is installable with PIP and hopefully easy to use and well documented. It doesn't take very long. So if you have some crystals laying around, then give it a try. Uh, and then uh, that's the last slide with references. Um, you did ask me, Vitaly, to show the crystal maps. I've over or overrun by quite a bit already, but we could do that if you like. But that's the end. OK, thank you very much, Daniel. Let us thank uh, Dan for his practice presentation, please. Okay, uh, so let me, um, yeah, let me stop recording.